Thank you, Paul. We're used to that now. <laughs> good to see you all here this evening, and it's especially good to have Steve and Sabrina here with us. I don't know if you both want to come up here, or just Steve, or why don't you both come up here? Um, I want to introduce them to those of you who weren't here on Sunday morning. Uh, Steve and Sabrina are part of our mission family, and they're based in Lyon, in France. And we are focusing on praying for them this evening. We have where are the prayer, praise and prayer points. Here they are. Um, so we have a number of praise and prayer, prayer points that are specifically focused on prayer for the Marshall family. You guys have five boys. Four. Four. Sorry, that's it. Five. <laughs> you almost killed us, sir. Thought we were going to say four. She didn't tell you. That's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> they have four boys. I'm just making sure you listen to me. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there are a number of praise and prayer points that we will be getting to in our prayer time. But I want you just to see them because you've probably seen photos and the details will be on the leaflets that we have, the mission team and on the board. But they're actually here with us and they're here until Sunday evening. They fly back on. Sunday evening, but this might cost this is your last time you're here, right? Because you're out somewhere else on Sunday morning for the ministry house. You uh yes, yeah, so they're staying in the ministry house, so they're not far away. Um, but this is the marshals, and we're just so pleased to have you guys here. I just want to make sure that everybody has seen you. And after this evening, you're gonna go up to the youth room for a seven o'clock, but by the time we finish, they'll probably be back down here, so you have a chance to if they're not here, they're upstairs at the so room to wear upstairs. Have a chat with Steve and Sabrina. It's really great to have you guys here. And I just want to make sure everybody can see you and we'll be praying for you. First Wednesday of every month, we're always going to be praying for a mission family, one of our partners. And tonight it's the Marshall family. So thank you guys for being here. We appreciate it very much. Okay, Carrie has an announcement. Well, real, real quick. My name is Carrie. For those of you who don't know me, um, I, along with Kate Like Cap, are is um, a deaconess, is that what it's called now? A deaconess for adult ministry. Um, and we need some help with a couple things. So for tonight, I'm asking if anybody would like to be in charge of snack or help out with snack, if you could see me afterwards or at any time. Um, and we can just kind of talk about what that is. It's super easy. It's just having somebody that can get the prepackaged food and some water and help put it out on Wednesdays. So anybody interested, come see me afterwards. Or if you see Kate Lightcap, you can talk to her too. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for all you do. We appreciate you. Uh, this evening, our subject is sin, and same format as always. For those of you who have been before, this is my cell phone number. If you have questions that you do not want to ask publicly, you can text me. Uh, we are going to begin with the question before we read a few lines from Wayne Rudin. Let's do our best to answer this question to begin with. What is sin? Say everything. <laughs> <laughs> One truth. To, did you say God's word? Well, yeah. well okay. To God's word. Okay. It's a gift from God for our choice. Okay. Okay. So hang on. Let me, let me just get my head around. G I F T. <laughs> <laughs> Are we saying that sin is a gift from God? It's a gift from God for our choosing. For what? For our, our choosing. choosing. We choose whether we want to sin or not. But we wouldn't have that if God didn't give us our choice. Okay. His, his gift may be. So the, the gift word is the word that, so we're talking about the free will aspect of the fact that we. Is that not a gift from God? Free will. But the gift is choice. It's a. <laughs> The ability to choose is look. The gift I was Roman Catholic for about 25 years. Uh, All right, uh, those nuns, let me tell you something. Uh, <laughs> so, I think the word that jars is the word gift. The gift definitely is the freedom that we have to do what's right, to exercise our free will. We're not robots, okay? So, in that regard, we do have the ability to choose to be obedient to the will of God or to indulge and give way to sin and sin nature. So I, I do absolutely understand what you're saying. It was just the way it was phrased, I think, just made me think for a second, but that's a good thing. Because just I think the, we do need does to the Catholic think. Church, do they say? Look, in the Catholic Church, all you can do is wrong and you can write it by paying it. 
Yeah, in the so moment. that's that's the Catholic Church. So when I say it's a gift from God that's our choosing, yeah, it's God has given us this gift that we can choose to do good or bad. When I say a gift is free will, right? Because the yeah. that's the gift. The fact that we have the ability to choose to do what's right, but sadly the sinful nature, which will lead us all too often to do that which is wrong. But but man only had that choice once. Once that choice was made, we no longer have a completely free will. (laughs) (laughs) will. The the subject of the lecture is coming. (laughs) (laughs) But we're not going to go with it. Say that again, Chris? Anything you have to repent. Okay, anything you have to repent of. Okay, yeah. Now, what was hit in my growing up? In a Bible church, the thing that they knocked into us was sin was missing the mark. That was the one the okay, thing yeah. that we always that I got heard the most growing up. Missing the mark. Sin is inherited. Inherited. It's both an action and a nature. Okay. Action and a nature. Sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness. It says in 1 John 3, everyone who sins breaks the law. Yeah. Separate those from God. Yep. So it's the cause of separation. We call it a spiritual death. Absolutely. It's it's the it's the cause of um, spiritual death. Spiritual death is sin. Is sin. Great. Happy with that selection of definitions. Against God's character, everything that's funny to God's will and the character there as well. Yeah, so we can talk about moral sin, moral character. Um, okay. it's, it's also sins of commission and omission. Commission and omission, yeah. So sins of commission and omission. Want to expand on that a little bit? No. Okay. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, see what Wayne Rude says about sin. Uh, he, I like the way he starts. Sin disrupts everything. Tell you the case of Jack. Uh, that's a great start. Sin disrupts everything. We don't live the lives we were originally designed to live, and we don't live in the world we were originally designed to live in. Sin masks the image of God in us. We no longer reflect the perfection of God. Sorry, the perfection God created us to reflect. Because of sin, things simply aren't the way they were originally meant to be. The story of the human race, as presented in the Bible, is the story of God fixing broken people living in a broken world. It's the story of God's victory over the many results of sin in the world. Sin, he says, by way of definition, beyond is something that disrupts everything. Sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. Okay, so he's talking about anything that fails to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, and nature. So we might say thought, word, and deed. Um, Act, attitude, and nature. God sets forth his moral law in many places throughout the Bible. Some examples, the primary example, the moral law of God is the Ten Commandments. The eight, we find that in Exodus 20. So we have the the moral law of nine of the Ten Commandments is to do with morality. One of them is to do with the Sabbath day, the day of rest. So the laws of morality are pulled across from the Old Testament to the New Testament, still apply to us today. So morality is something that Wayne Green focuses on here. Uh, The Ten Commandments is the first he mentions, and he lists them. And then he moves to talk about the fact that God is absolutely not characterized by sin or impacted by sin in any way. In fact, it says God is eternally good in his character. 
all that he is conforms perfectly to his moral law. Therefore, anything contrary to his moral law is contrary to his character. That is, contrary to God himself. So anything that can be classified as sin is contrary to not only the moral law, but the very character of who God is, and therefore it's detestable to him. It's something which he hates. He hates sin because it directly contradicts everything he is. Okay, so when we're looking at perfection, as far as a definition is concerned, there's only one, and it's God. And everything that is not characterized by perfection will move against the morality of God and against uh, who God himself is, his character can be classified as sin. He then moves on to say where sin came from. Where does, where does sin come from? Where, the origin of sin, we've kind of mentioned this before in one of our studies, but where does sin come from? Okay, so Adam and Eve and pride, both of those answers are correct. Adam and Eve and the sin they committed was pride because they desired to be like God. So the root of that sin was pride and desire to be great like God himself. Yes, okay, so the first sinner was the angel that God cast out of heaven, who is now the devil, who is now Satan. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. So the origin of sin came from that fallen angel, Lucifer, who is now the ruler of the demons. And sin impacted the lives of Adam and Eve. Uh, their direct sin was taking fruit from the, the tree in the middle of the garden that they, they were forbidden to eat from. Satan was very crafty, wasn't he? When he came to the form of the serpent and said, did God really say that you should eat from any tree in the garden? And they're like, no, he didn't say that. He said, he said you, you can eat from every tree, just not this one. And then this one looks amazing. And this one looks... And, and Satan says, no, surely God didn't say that. He just doesn't want you to be like him. And Adam and Eve realize that actually it's very appealing to the eye. Yeah? It's also good for gaining knowledge and wisdom. And they, 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 the same sin that Satan fell for. Once they want to be more like God, it's pride again. So they take this fruit. Genesis chapter 3, the fall happens. Sin comes into the world. Everything is marked by sin. God's changed in every way. Uh, we have specific mention of direct results of sin um, in women going through pain in childbirth, thorns and thistles being part of the earth. By the sweat of your brow now, will you care for the earth and live off of the earth? Whereas before it was pleasurable, enjoyable, they dwelt in the presence of God and they were naked and there was no shame. And all of a sudden they're, they're covering themselves with fig leaves. It changed dramatically when, when sin came into the world. And it has impacted us, right? Yeah. All the way out. It's impacted us because not only do we live in a fallen world, but we are fallen people. We have a sinful nature. There are two sin, sin there are two types of sin. There's, there's original sin and intentional sin. So when we're born, we're all born in sin. We have, as part of our makeup, original sin with fallen beings. And then as we grow older, we start to engage in intentional sin. Uh, that doesn't take very long for most kids. The nature which takes over when you ask your child who might only be a few months old or a year old and you ask them to do something. No! You know, it doesn't, nobody teaches them that. Well, I don't think most parents teach their kids to say that like that. But there's something in them, and you can see it right from the very beginning, that their nature is formal. And they begin to engage in not only uh, the original sin part of their makeup, but the intention of sin as well. Uh, so on page 63, Bruder really talks about Satan and his demons existing. Um, Adam and Eve and everything that we just talked about comes in chapter, sorry, in paragraph two of page 63. And then it says, as a result, Adam's nature became sinful. Sin became something that Adam naturally did. Uh, we naturally sin. Is that true? Okay, so we're naturally bent to sin. That's our default position. Meaning then we have to strive or work hard not to sin? Or does that, how does that work? It's hard to try, it's not going to work. Okay, so we have to try. We try. Well, we, we can never be. Right. Never. Okay, so we can never be good enough to, at this point, I presume we're talking about enter eternity with God in heaven. 
We can have a earn a righteousness of our standards of perfection. Okay, the standard is perfection, and heaven is a place of perfection. And for God to allow anything even slightly imperfect into perfection means that that perfection ceases to be perfection because of the blemish. Yeah, agree. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we all have a huge problem because we all have blemish. Mm -hmm. Some of us have bigger blemishes than others, um, but we're all blemished. We're all sinners, and naturally speaking, we can't enter heaven. And most religions of the world teach that we need to pursue righteousness or right living in order to get to heaven. And that is a religion of absolute hopelessness because you will never get it. You will never achieve it. The Bible says that's not, that's not how it works. In fact, righteousness only comes one way. How does righteousness come? Yes, the gift of God, Jesus Christ, and through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's how we become righteous. So when we become Christians, are we righteous immediately at that point? No. Yes. We're justified. Yes. <laughs> we have Jesus' righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ in its fullness or in part. Or the work in progress. <laughs> okay. We're justified, but we're not sanctified. No, no thing. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so the, there's a great transaction that takes place when we become Christians. Okay, so the righteousness of Christ, the word is imputed, is imputed into our lives. So we receive the righteousness of Christ, and our sin is placed upon him. So there's a great transaction. Our sin placed on him, his righteousness imputed into our lives. So by basic, by, by, by nature of the fact that we have the righteousness of Christ dwelling within us, are we saying that we are now like Christ? We are now perfect as Christians. We're not. Why are we not perfect when we've got the righteousness of Christ within us? Because we still have okay, because we still have the old nature. While we're here, the old and the new natures wrestle against one another. Okay, so we are new creations. The Bible tells us 2 Corinthians 5 17. Therefore, I have a new creation, the old is gone, the new is come. But we still have the sin nature. So as Christians, we're not perfect. When, when will we be made perfect? In, in death, at our ultimate glorification, when we are made to be like Christ. So in Philippians, we were talking about running the race to win the prize, to be taken heaven, to be made more like Jesus. So we are in part made like Christ when we trust in him. We do have his righteousness within us, but the righteousness of Christ within us, which is the new nature, wages war against the old nature, which is the sin nature that's still part of our makeup because we're human beings. And until we die and are made fully righteous like Christ, we battle and we fight and we work hard and the work. So we're justified, that's the righteousness in dwelling us. And the other word, to the same. Well, the working is sanctified. Okay, so it's the sanctification is the working hard at becoming more like Jesus, not for your salvation, but you are saved to do good works. You're saved to strive to become more like Jesus. Um, this is salvation. It's the trusting in Christ, the justification that earns you your place in heaven, not your works. But James does say that faith without deeds is dead. So you can't just claim to be justified, saved through faith in Jesus Christ, and do nothing. James says, if that's you, your faith is not actually faith at all. You're dead. You're not already saved. So you actually, your claim of faith in Jesus Christ, your claim of righteousness imputed in your life, through faith and trust in Him, needs to be backed up by actions, by works, not for your righteousness, but because of. But, but that's where that real interesting balance occurs that we illuminate free will, which we will sin. Mm -hmm. But as we are in Christ, we also have. Holy Spirit mm -hmm. being part of our teamwork Absolutely. works as we're describing. Yes. So the Holy Spirit is a key part in our sanctification process because he gives us the desire and the ability and the willpower and the strength that we require to persevere, to resist temptation. The Bible tells us there'll never be a temptation that comes to you that's too great for you to bear. Now we fall into temptation frequently, at least I do. But there is actually no temptation that's too great to bear. And the spirit with us is he, he is the one who helps us on our, our road to sanctification. I don't want to talk too much about justification and sanctification tonight because they are studies. 
that we want to get to. I mean, as we talked about that on the curriculum as well. But doesn't it say the right again? Isn't it important and safe to say without the Holy Spirit, left to our own free will, we don't go forward? Yeah, I think without the Spirit in us, left to our own free will, we are inherently evil people who do not by nature strive to be like Jesus Christ. It's that converting, born again, regenerating power that comes from the Spirit of God that gives us the desire. So how is a non-Christian a nice person? How is a non-Christian a nice person? That's a great question, okay? How is a non-Christian a nice person? Is there such a thing as a nice non-Christian? Sure. Yeah, sure. We all know plenty, right? Common self grace. Self-interest. For self-interest? I'm nice to you, you'll be nice to me. I'm nice to my boss, I'm nice to most. Okay. I think we lack the ability to understand grace. And as a sinner and a believer, with the Holy Spirit working in us, we understand grace. Mm -hmm. I think we do all have built within us a certain level of natural understanding concerning this principle circle of morality. I think everybody who is honest with you will always say that there are certain things in the world that are wrong, always. And yet, their system of belief probably doesn't actually allow them to say that, because if they start to say that, they take themselves down the path that they struggle to fight against. So most people are going to say that, that you know, absolute truth doesn't exist, truth is for you, what you want it to be, truth is for you, I want it to be. But can anybody really say that murder is in some cases okay, or rape is in some cases okay? Um, everybody knows that really those things are not okay. And yet, some people will nick themselves into such deep holes concerning the nature of truth, absolute truth, lowercase case kind of T truth, whatever it might be, but they're left, they're left in a position where actually anything can, can be okay. But really they know it can't be because there's something built within us, some sort of moral meter, Chris. It seems almost like that goes back to last week because we are naming God with people before we come to Christ. Yes. Yes, so there is something within us that gives us uh, a conscience that actually, sadly, over time gets dulled. So our conscience through our sin and continual sinning gets, gets dulled. Something that we, we did one time, um, you know, we, we felt terrible for doing it. Actually, now we do it, but we don't even think about it. So our consciences do get Dumb and numbed by, by John speaks of the light that lighteth everyone that comes into the world. So mm -hmm. everyone has some portion of light, mm -hmm. some some sense. So I mean that that's the common conscience. That, yeah. You know, that yeah. murder is wrong. Yeah, I, I think I think everybody does have so as you put it, some portion of light or at least understanding of light or good and evil. Uh, the image of God. Yeah, because we're created the image of God. And that takes us back to where we are, where we are last time. Every part of our being, says Wayne Grudem, is affected by sin. Our intellects, our emotions, our desires, our hearts, our goals, our motives, and even our physical bodies. All are subject to the decay and destruction caused by sin. Our actions, our attitudes, and our very natures all make us guilty of sin. We receive not only Adam's sinful nature, but also his sin-produced guilt. Adam's action resulted not only in his own guilt, but also in the guilt of every other human. What explains, sin came into the world through one man, death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all sin. That's Romans 5.12. And in Romans 5.19 it says, by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Therefore, when Adam sinned, God thought of us all as having sin. Now, a lot of people are going to say, that's not fair. Yeah? I mean, I understand why they say that. That's not fair. Because he sinned. I'm, I'm now sinner. I'm now marred in some way. Uh, have you heard of you have you said that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's a, that's a logical thing to say. How is that fair? If God was actually who you claim he is, loving, kind, and merciful, and why would, why would that be the, big, the start for all of us? And, and that's a big question. And the, the bigger question is why Genesis chapter 3 had happened at all. Why didn't God create Adam and Eve? 
knowing that ultimately they would sin against him. And through that, condemn not only themselves, but all who followed at their time. The death would become a reality that didn't exist. That evil and everything else that is contrary to the moral standard that God sets for us uh, would, would, would come into the world, a world that was perfect. Why did God create knowing that that was all going to happen, that sin would be part ultimately of his creation? Why, did, why, why that way? For his own glorification. For it, how is he glorified through that? By paying penalty for it, okay. allowing it, but then paying the penalty for it, okay. and bringing us back into relationship to him. Yeah, so allowing sin to come into the world and then stepping in to put that right, to pay the price for us. Great, he, 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 can, he glorifies, as Steve said, he glorifies, and he is glorified by the yeah. And that's what all that really matters. Yeah, I think I, Jane, you want to say something? Yeah, I, you know, you asked about why it's fair. It presupposes that I would sin. It's only unfair if I think I'm not going to sin. Yeah, absolutely. But the reality is, we're all going to sin. And if I have to answer it for myself, mm -hmm. then I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. Because if Christ died for one, Adam, and that's it. That's it, because Adam's sin wasn't imparted to me, then who's to die for me? Yeah. Me. That would be and, easy. Right. Yeah. So the ultimate fair is that Adam is my representative head. He sinned, I sinned, which I was going to anyway. Mm -hmm. And then Christ could be the payment. Yeah. The payment once for all. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and so right, that's it. that's I, where you get away from the fairness. Yeah, I agree. And you know, the word fair is it's kind of a subjective term because it really depends how you understand fairness. But um, either one does die for one. So Christ dies for Adam, somebody else dies for Eve, somebody else dies for John, somebody else dies for Tom. Either that happens or Christ dies once and for all. But then the question that comes before that is why did God even, why even sin? Why was it there at all? What was, why did it even have to be? Why was there even such a thing as sin? Why could it not just be Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and that forever? He created with free will, which is why we landed where we landed. Yeah. It makes our lives meaningful to have the freedom. It, it certainly, yeah, God created us to bring Him glory and to create us to be robots would not bring Him glory because we would be basically programmed to love Him. That, we don't program our kids to love us. That's not real love. They choose to love us, hopefully, because of the way we love them. Um, so, yeah, we're not programmed. So it gives God greater glory. The angels who, who sinned could not be redeemed. Mm -hmm. It's not that God figured out a new <laughs> way to be glorified yeah. because it was all there before he made the angels. Mm -hmm. It was still there. But we give greater glory because there is there are those of us who are redeemed. Yeah. I think, I think we're, we're close. For me, I think Genesis chapter 3 had to happen for one sole reason. I think I've shared it before. So that we could see God in his fullness. So that we could see the love, the grace, the mercy, the wrath, the jealousy, the judgment. Every single characteristic of God we see. Where do we see that all? At Calvary. If there's no Genesis chapter 3, we don't need Calvary. Okay, we don't need Jesus Christ. We don't need that ultimate display of love for us. So I think, I think all, all the things we're talking about are right. But one of the key reasons Genesis chapter three had to happen is so that we could fully, or at least, so we can begin to understand who God is and really how much God loves us and His full character. Because at the Calvary, you see all of those aspects of Christ, of God, His wrath, His jealousy, His judgment, His mercy, His grace, His love. Everything is seen at Calvary. And I think Calvary had to happen. So that we can see and understand, or just begin to do God is in his fullness. Uh, and I, I think that's without Genesis 3, you don't have any of that. That has to be one of the key reasons why. It's an all plan that results in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. He desired, I, I don't know if we'll ever know the reason until we're there. Mm -hmm. Why did he want us in his kingdom? Why, why did he want his kingdom with us in it? Yeah. 
I mean, God was and is completely self-sufficient. He didn't create us because he needs us. His creation was an act of love. And him sending Jesus to die was an act of love. It's actually an amazing thing to think about. Again, I've said this before, but that owl is a creation. And if I created that owl, I'm outside of that owl. But for me to descend, to be inside that owl, is to humble myself, to become part of something that I've created. And that's actually what God did in Jesus. He saw his creation and he humbled himself, Philippians chapter 2, to the point where he became part of that which he had created. Not a created being, um, conceived, of course, by the Holy Spirit, but he descended to the the depths that he descended to. So, bringing us back to where we were, ultimately, we can see how much he loves us, how merciful and loving and kind and gracious he is, that he would do that. If that thing went wrong, I would throw it out. Okay, but God, that's not how God worked. Creation fell, and it was all part of God's plan so that he and his love could descend into his creation to show, how, to show everybody all that he had created, those he had created, how much he loves them. By descending into creation. That's an amazing act of humility. So we see humility and love and grace and mercy and wrath and judgment and justice and all of this things accomplished. That's why Genesis 3 has come. Does that make sense? When Ruth talks a little more about how sin affects us in page 65, scripture is clear. He says, There is no one who does not sin. Okay? So let's any of us imagine for even a split second that we are outside of this kind of First Kings 8:46. There is none who does good, not even one. Psalm 14, verse 3. Is that true? There, there is no one who does good, not even one. That's back to what we were you were saying just now. There, there's this is in the Bible. There is no one who does good, not even one. What does that mean? It's done totally good. Sorry, sir. Sure. One slip up, one mistake, one wrong thing, just takes one. Okay, and then you're not good. How? Huh? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not that we don't do good things. We don't do consistently always good. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that we don't necessarily do good things, but we are not by nature good. So bad people do good things, right? That's possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, bad people do good things, but that doesn't mean that they're good people. So we can do good things, but we're not by nature good people. We're actually sinful people. Um, all have sinned, Romans 3.23, and fall short of the glory of God. And John in 1 John 1 verse 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I've never met a person that will actually argue until they're ready in the face that they have never sinned. <laughs> have you ever met anybody like this? No, I, I think everybody on this planet knows that they are sinners. That they've all, and they'll hold their hands up. Everybody will say, Yeah, I do wrong things. I've done wrong things. So I think that actually is a pretty much generally accepted thing that everybody is a sinner. Everybody does wrong things. Jesus said, No one is good but God. Yes, no one is good but God alone, because the definition of good is God when it comes to the Bible. And none of us are like him. But how does Noah fit in? Sorry? How does Noah fit in? How does Noah fit in? Good question. He asked the same about Job, the righteous man, and none like him. The rich man will be there are a few people in the Bible that are referred to as good and righteous. How does that work? They still hate him. Were they good as in God? <laughs> Maybe. But Paul says he's the worst of the worst. There are no people that say that. He says the man chief amongst it. And actually, I you know, I read I read the story of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus, and I'm like, he's in Jerusalem, he's going to Damascus, 150 miles away. It says he's going there to see if there were any people along to the way, Captain W followed Jesus. That's how much he hated Christians. And then God steps into his life and converts him, <laughs> makes him a new creation, and he's the one that ends up writing most of the New Testament, reaches many, many people for Christ, goes on three mission journeys. And I'm like, why him? There are so many other people who were already faithful followers of God. Why him? Paul says, you know what? So that you can see that God can save even the worst of sinners. Even in me, 
God can God can change me. God can change. He, he's the one giving approval to Stephen's death as he's being stoned to death, right? Not very long before his trip to Damascus and his encounter with Christ. And Paul says it's because it's proof that even me, the worst of sinners, it's not beyond the grace of God. So God chooses to use sometimes the most unlikely of people. God sent the penalty for eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was death. Was death their immediate, uh, their immediate consequence? Not, not physical death. Yeah, I, I, I say yes and no. Not physical death, but definitely spiritual death. At that point, they were spiritually dead. And they had through, through sin condemned themselves ultimately to die physically. So there's a spiritual death that takes place, there's a physical death that takes place, and there's a second death. Which is to be passed into the lake of fire to enter into hell for eternity. So there's a spiritual death, a physical death, and an eternal. Christ comes and makes it possible for us to have that separation through sin and spiritual death made right again. So, did anybody ever be reconciled to God? Yeah, that's the question. Were they ever reconciled to God as a result of their actions? In other words, did they ever repent? <laughs> yes, yeah, so the sacrificial system of the Old Testament was what they had at that time. By the way, it was insufficient, so it certainly did not uh, cover them for everything. It was insufficient because the one who would be all sufficient was to come. But not at that time, because the sacrificial system came through who? After their lives, it came through who? When did the sacrificial system when was that all instituted? Moses was yeah. So many years later. So we don't know. No, we actually have no record. But we know that God was gracious to Adam because he posted the angel to prevent him from going back to yes. the garden and live forever. Absolutely. So they could not live forever. Right? Exactly. 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 And also, Jesus is, is also called the second Adam. Yeah, but something in that as well. So the second Adam, when, when you read it, the second Adam, that's Jesus Christ. Because there's obviously a parallel there between the perfection that was Adam and what he said in Jesus Christ is the second perfect man ever. Um, so yeah, I mean, I presume Adam and Eve realized, certainly by the fact that they hid from God after they'd done what they did, they realized that they had done wrong. They come in themselves, dress themselves, thrown out of the garden. Um, and ultimately from them came good and bad, because if they had some good kids, some bad kids, right? And that's what we have today. The nations came from them. Sin has affected all of us, but here's the hope that we need to finish with love as time. <coughs> When we sin as forgiven Christians, our legal standing before God is not affected. We are still forgiven because Christ's death paid for all our sins. While sin does not affect our status or standing with God, it does affect our fellowship with God. For God is grieved by our sin. This can often result in God's discipline in our lives. Even though all Christians still sin, they should not participate in long term pattern of greater and greater disobedience to God's moral law. For no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, First John 3, 9. But if a person makes a practice of sinning, that is, if someone continues in a pattern of disobedience without repentance, he may not have ever truly put his trust in Jesus for salvation. That is the sinful pattern of his life, which shows that he never really was a Christian. In contrast, when Christians sin, they should earnestly and quickly confess their sins to God. When we do so, we will find God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1 9. So we will continue to sin, but there is forgiveness. And we should not be marked by continual sin, a, an increasing continual sin. Uh, we should be marked by those who sin and we don't repent because we realize that we have sinned. And when we sin, we grieve God, we sin against God. We're not perfect, we sin, but we repent. And there is always forgiveness. So we just need to make sure that we are not continuing in persistent sin. That ramps up, but that we are becoming more and more like Jesus. Two steps forward, one step back sometimes. Sometimes one step forward, three steps back. But we're ultimately becoming more like Christ. We're finding forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And one day the promises will be made exactly like him. That's what we look forward to. The sin nature will be gone. 
the righteousness of Christ and the fully honest will be like Jesus. That would be a great day. And that's what's coming forward in the name of Jesus. So let's pray. Uh, we are going to move to uh, pray for the Christian family on the cheek here. I promise we are going to make this week. Uh, how maybe if we could, as usual, we went with S2. Yeah. And we can go row one, row two, row three. And in fact, uh, Jeremy and